Are you okay? Convert. So let me just move around a few things here. Oops. Okay. Uh, just give me a second. I think. Uh, sure. Are the Zoom kind of windows also visible in your case? Okay. So we just see the uh, presentation, which is good, right? But, yeah. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, there's some problem, just a second. Uh, yeah, just give me like two minutes. I think uh, there's some small issue that I need to fix. Okay, so if, um, yeah, if it's fine, maybe I can get started whenever, yeah. Right, so Everybody's um, ready? Yeah. I'm used to uh, the presentation mode, Suraj, because right now it's not in the presentation mode. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think right now we are seeing uh, the Google Slides. This is a bit weird. Is it better now? Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, okay. Yeah, I never figured out how this works with like Zoom and Google Slides. Anyway, now it's fine. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I guess we can give a short introduction then before you get started, if you're ready. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks everyone for uh, joining this week. So, today we have uh, Siraj Sinovas. Um, he's a postdoctoral post researcher at Harvard University. Um, his research is primarily focused on uh, interpretable uh, machine learning. And today uh, we're lucky to have him uh, kind of giving some ins and outs of uh, specifically um, interpretability on neural networks. So really looking forward to this talk. Awesome. So yeah, let me just get started. So hi, so my, I'm Suraj Srinivas and I'm a postdoctoral research fellow uh, working with Professor Hima Lakaraju at Howard University. Um, and today I'll be mainly talking about when are deep neural networks really interpretable. And this essentially involves discussing their pitfalls and when they should be used and when they should not be used. Right? And most of the work that I'll present today was done as part of my PhD at uh, EDIP Research Institute and EPFL. All right. Okay. So maybe we can just get started with this quote, which I really like, which is uh, by Moser and Smolensky in 1989. Um, where they say that, you know, one thing that's uh, connectionist networks have in common with brains is that if you open them, open them up and peer inside, all you can see is a big pile of poop, right? So this is not, uh, this was true in 1989 and it's still true today in 2022 because you have all these large models such as, you know, all these large language models, ResNets and so on, which contain like several hundreds of layers. But then at the same time, we don't have any um, actionable insight about what's actually going on within these layers in a semantically useful manner, right? Sure, we understand the kind of computation that happens in these layers, like uh, in a mechanical fashion, but then we don't really understand, um, you know, which of these computations are necessary um, and what they're exactly doing for the problem in hand in a semantically useful manner, 
right? So that's the problem that we'll uh, broadly tackle today. And uh, that is essentially the topic of interpretability. Um, and the main idea to use interpretability is to be able to use it for uh, the task of model introspection, right? So let's say, for instance, that there's a doctor who plans to use, uh, you know, a deep neural network to look at images of chest X-rays, right? And let's say in this example, there's a deep neural network which looks at the image of a chest X-ray and you know classifies that it's a pneumonia. Well, then without any further um, information about whether the deep neural network is looking at medically relevant features of the image or not, it's actually difficult for the doctor to take any actionable insights uh, using this classification alone, right? So for instance, it could be that, you know, it does actually uh, look at some medically relevant features or it looks at, you know, something like the sensor noise or something to make its decision, in which case, you know, the doctor should not trust the model, right? Uh, so essentially, whenever we have a human in the loop application, uh, we'd like to have some way for the neural network to communicate to the user what exactly it's uh, doing, essentially. And on the other hand, uh, we can also consider our you know day-to-day -day machine learning uh, engineering, for instance, and we'd like to be able to diagnose common failure modes um, and then try to fix them, essentially. Right. So in this case, we see that uh, there's a car that's, you know, uh, submerged in water and a deep neural network thinks that, you know, it's like a whale or something of that sort. But then now the question is, this is obviously wrong, but then what in the image actually made the neural network misclassify this image is the question, right? And if we know what it made it misclassify, can we fix it by introducing like the correct images of uh, the relevant kind, for instance? Right. So um, for these kind of applications, you would require some, some form of interpretability. So um, while the objectives of the previous slide, let's say um, uh, they were interesting, uh, the question that we shall ask here is that whether this kind of interpretability is even possible. Right. So whether deep neural networks are indeed interpretable, and if they are, what kind of properties do I need to satisfy such that they are interpretable? Right. So you can think of this um, arbitrary scenario where we have an arbitrarily complex deep neural network, um, which the human wants to interpret. And it's intuitively clear that if the model is arbitrarily complicated, there's no way in which the human can interpret them, interpret this function in any conceivable manner. So only if we have certain structural assumptions about the model, only then can we talk about some form of interpretability. Right. So in this talk, we'll essentially focus on two such cases broadly. Um, first, I'll talk about this work where we broadly look at the class of really neural networks um, and propose a kind of uh, visualization for these kinds of models, but also which goes for a broader class of models. Um, and secondly, we shall consider uh, the broad class of what we call generative neural networks. Um, which are essentially discriminative neural networks that accidentally also have a generative property. And uh, yeah, look at how these models can be interpretable as well, right? So in this talk, uh, I mean, so feel free to like, you know, uh, ask me a question at any time. Uh, so yeah, that would be, I guess, the most, um, yeah, productive way to kind of move forward. Okay. So yeah, so let's get started with the first um, uh, kind of work here which is a full gradient representation for neural network visualization. It was published in New 2019. And this was like joint work with my supervisor, Professor Francois Flore from um, EPFL and University of Geneva. All right. So um, this work is concerned with um, saliency map representations, right? So the idea is that, uh, let's say, if you're talking about, let's say, image classifiers. Uh, so a saliency algorithm in this case takes as an input an image and a deep neural network, and then outputs a map, which is actually of the same size as the image. Uh, and But then it highlights the important regions of the image as seen by the deep neural network, right? So in this example, uh, the, saliency, the saliency algorithm, whatever it is, it's telling us that the head of the eagle is actually the most important feature of this image in order to make the classification, right? Um, so what it could mean, for instance, is that uh, maybe if the head of the eagle was missing or then, you know, maybe if, if it was occluded by something else or maybe uh, if the wings were not present, um, 
So in all of these cases, what the classification would be, right? So if the head was absent, maybe uh, then we are not able to make this classification. But then if the wings were absent, maybe we are still able to make this classification. So that's the broad kind of statements uh, that we can make by using uh, what we, what how we can define these uh, important scores. Uh, but then there are like variations which each, with each algorithm, which we shall kind of discuss in, in the coming slides. Okay. So, right. So the most common way to visualize saliency for neural networks, particularly CNNs, uh, is essentially input gradient saliency, right? Uh, where where um, importance is essentially encoded by the sensitivity of the pixels. Right. So let's say F is uh, the neural network in question, which in this case is a scalar value neural network, let's say, which basically means that it maps a vector input X to a scalar value Y. So in this case, the gradient of the output with respect to the input is what we shall define to be the saliency map. And in this case, uh, we've just uh, visualized the, the magnitude of the gradients, which broadly seems to highlight that somehow the head and you know the tail parts of the dog are important. Um, but we notice that it's the overall the map is uh, somewhat noisy and um, it's kind of unclear what's happening here. But actually more importantly, a more kind of fundamental problem with using the gradients to uh, kind of interpret um, important features in the image is that uh, we don't get any attributions towards in the flat regions of the image. Right. So um, gradients essentially encode like the, the rate of change essentially. And if we are stuck in, if we'd like to interpret, um, you know, images that occur at the flat regions of the function or at local extrema, then we're out of luck because the gradient there is always equal to zero. Uh, so using this method, it's actually not possible to identify important or uh, less important features. Right. So partly to overcome this problem. There's been a bunch of work actually trying to define another notion of um, importance where, um, okay, so actually before that, just to kind of talk about this a little bit, here importance is essentially encoded by the sensitivity of the model to perturbations in the input, right? So that's exactly what gradients compute. That is um, a pixel is important if by changing the pixel value a little bit, the model output changes by a large amount, right? So that's broadly what the gradients capture and that's what sensitivity is, right? Um, okay, but then this is not enough. So there are a bunch of these works which try to quantify uh, importance by requiring this additional property, which is often called completeness, right? So completeness says the following. So let's say I'm able to quantify the contributions of pixels, each of the pixels in the image, right? Um, then it should happen that they should add up to the model output, which essentially means that um, if I identify numerical scores for like, you know, the contribution of pixel one, pixel two, pixel three, and so on, they should numerically add up to the model output. Um, so this doesn't have the problem which we discussed the previous time. That is, you know, if we are stuck in flat regions of the image, then, you know, we get like zero attributions. Uh, so in this case, if the output is non-zero, we always get like non-zero attributions. But then notice that there's a very weak condition and actually does not actually define a concrete notion of saliency. And this is more just like a necessary condition than, than a sufficient condition, All right? So in literature, essentially at that point, we had these two different kinds of, um, let's say, uh, notions of importance. And the, the natural question that we asked here was, can we actually define a saliency map that satisfies both these conditions, right? The condition of sensitivity and completeness. And it turns out that the answer is no, that this is impossible, right? So in the paper, we actually provide the complete formal proof, but the idea is the following, that um, neural networks or actually saliency maps cannot simultaneously satisfy both these uh, properties of local sensitivity and the global completeness precisely because the saliency maps don't capture the dependencies between input pixels, right? So notice that saliency maps just tell you um, how important each individual pixel is, but then they don't tell you, um, they don't provide any sort of dependency information across different pixels, right? So what do I mean by that? So let's take a very simple example here. So uh, in this example, let's say we're trying to classify this image of a bird, right? 
And uh, let's say we're trying to figure out which pixels in the image are important when trying to classify the bird, right? So on the left, what I'll try to do is that I'll try to replace each individual, let's say, pixel with a black pixel and try to see if uh, the model output changes or not, or not um, right? And when I do that, I find that even if I remove any arbitrary pixel in the image, the model is still able to recognize the bird because you know, like, you know the pixels are really small uh, and most of the relevant features are kind of still available. But then if I remove a bunch of pixels at once, uh, which is the image on the right, then I see that the new model is no longer able to recognize the bird, right? So what this essentially means is that we are not able to summarize the importance of the pixels in a patch in terms of the sum of importance of um, the pixels, right? So on the right side, basically we'd like to quantify the importance of a patch of pixels. Uh, but then on the left side, we are not able to write that in terms of sum of importances of pixels because each pixel is actually unimportant. But then when, you, when we put them together, somehow there's a nonlinear effect that's happening um, where we are not, no longer able to recognize uh, the bird in hand. Um, right? So this is essentially kind of the overall phenomenon that's going on, which is why you know the, the impossibility result is true, uh, which you know broadly tells us that you know maybe we need to be not just um, extract um, you know uh, the important fee each important pixels, but also extract um, the information about what patches are important and so on, right? Because you know one you cannot derive one from the other. Okay, uh, but still, right? So we have this impossibility theorem which says that you know uh, let's say interpretability in this kind of manner is impossible. But then you can still ask the question. Are there any specific model classes where it is possible, right? So that's like the interesting case for us. And uh, it turns out that is true. There are actually model classes where you could uh, satisfy both these at once. And these are actually uh, really neural networks without biases, right? So um, for these models, it turns out that the following expression is true. That is, let F be again uh, our scalar valued neural network with input x, uh, weights w, and biases b. Uh, and in this case, let's say the biases are always 0. Then we can always write the output in terms of the gradients and the input. Right? And this is a unique property of ReLU neural networks without bias. And uh, this happens because of like the homogeneity property of like the ReLU nonlinearity. And uh, yeah, so this is essentially something called like Euler's homogeneous function theorem. Um, but the core idea here is that because of this property, we are able to satisfy like the spirit of both sensitivity and the completeness property, right? So this, this satisfies sensitivity because like, the gradient alone is able to um, kind of reconstruct the model output, which, which gives us completeness. And since this involves only the gradients, um, we have the sensitivity being satisfied as well, right? So this is a very specific model class where you know, things are nice. But then, of course, the question is for like the practical neural networks that we use, you know, is there something we could do? And it turns out that we can uh, extend this result obtained via like the homogeneity of ReLU uh, to the case where the biases are non-zero, right? And when we do that, what we do is that, what we get is that we get this additional term, which involves the sensitivity of the neurons as well, in addition to the input sensitivity that we already had for the previous time. Um, so essentially what this equation tells us is that for any ReLU neural network, um, or actually uh, the statement is true even beyond ReLU neural networks, but let's just say for now that for any ReLU neural network, the output can always be written as in terms of the gradients of the input and the gradients of each of the bias uh, layers, gradient of the bias of each of the layers, right? And it turns out that due to chain rule, gradient of the bias is exactly equal to gradient of each of the intermediate layers. So this is a very nice way of looking at this, is that we are decomposing the output in terms of gradients of each of the in intermediate layers in the neural network. Right, and uh, so the, uh, let's say, so the natural question here is, uh, what exactly are the biases in this case? So biases could constitute like the typical uh, bias parameters in, let's say, your convolutional layers or you know, your fully connected layers. But then there are also other kinds of biases which do occur in neural networks. Uh, 
One of them is the batch normalization. Um, so here we define bias as anything that is an additive quantity um, in terms of its parameterization, right? So a batch normalization has uh, like a running mean and then a standard deviation and so on. And because of this running mean, there's an implicit bias term, which is actually different from just the bias parameter B, right? Which also needs to be taken into account here. Um, and further, if we have like a non-relu non-linearity, then the y-intercept at the local linear approximation kind of can be thought of as a kind of uh, uh, bias variable. Uh, but then this is in general very difficult to account for. So let's just like ignore this for now. And uh, yeah, so the idea is that for relu neural networks, we only need to consider the uh, additional bias of batch normalization, and then we are done. Okay, so let's look at this a bit pictorially to see what's happening. So what essentially the full gradient expression tells us is that uh, for the image of a cat being fed through the scalar value neural network, we're able to exactly decompose the numerical output or write the numerical output in terms of you know, this first map, which is the input gradient times input, plus you know, the bias gradient of neurons in layer one plus the bias gradients of neurons in layer two and so on, which is essentially, as I mentioned earlier, just the gradients of the intermediate layers. So this means that we are essentially decomposing the output in terms of um, like feature-wise gradients. And note that this naturally incorporates the importance of a pixel at multiple receptive fields, which is what we said was important to begin with in one of the earlier slides. Yeah, so it's interesting that uh, you know full gradients naturally incorporate this uh, behavior. Okay, so while this kind of um, expression is nice, uh, this is also slightly inconvenient because if we have like um, hundreds of layers in our neural networks, we get hundreds of such maps, and it's actually difficult to understand, uh, you know, what to use and what to ignore, and so on. Um, so as a heuristic, we propose uh, the full grad saliency map, right? So which essentially involves simply aggregating all of these uh, different layer-wise maps, right? So what we observe here in practice is that, let's say you have your input gradients and then you have, you know, bias gradients at some particular layer and so on. Here, all of these are kind of um, upsampled so that they're of the same dimension. Um, then we see that each of these individual gradients are kind of noisy, but then when we aggregate all of them, um, we see that the result is actually less noisy than each of the individual maps themselves. Uh, and the aggregation involves the psi function here, which essentially uh, takes the absolute value and then upsamples it and so on. Uh, but the idea is like very simple. We just take all of these layer-wise gradient maps and like kind of add them together, aggregate them together uh, to get what we call the full grad saliency map. Okay. Um, and yeah, so since this is a saliency map, this has all the problems of saliency maps, right? So it's that uh, the impossibility theorem still holds that, you know, we are not able to capture like the two properties at once and so on. Um, but then this impossibility theorem doesn't hold for full gradients, which is actually a representation that is more expressive than saliency maps because it involves, you know, multiple maps at all of these. Uh, uh, let's say, uh, depths of the neural network or these features of the neural network, right? So just look at some like qualitative results for now. Um, we see that full grad is actually more detailed and less noisy than, you know, some of the existing methods because of the fact that it uses multi-scale information uh, across different layers of the neural network. Um, and also when it comes to quantitative evaluation, um, okay. When it comes to quantitative evaluation, we see that it does better than some of the other methods in literature. Um, so I won't go too much into detail about what these metrics are, but essentially the pixel perturbation tests um, basically tests whether um, some particular saliency method captures unimportant pixels correctly. So the idea is that if a pixel is unimportant, uh, then I'm able to remove it and the model is still able to classify the image correctly. Uh, so the pixel perturbation test tests for this. And then remove and retrain test essentially tests for the fact that if a pixel is important and then I remove it, and then I create a new data set and train a new kind of neural network with it, 
then the essential information to classify the image is gone. So the resulting model should perform really badly. All right. So in this case, lower is better. So in both cases, essentially lower is better. And um, yeah, we observe that you know, full grad is able to do better than some of the other uh, methods in literature. Uh, Suraj, uh, may I yes. up here and ask a question here? So uh, that aggregation that you mm -hmm. have across different layers, uh, you mentioned that simply the absolute value of the, uh, essentially the norm of the gradient yes. uh, upsampled and then summed, right? Mm -hmm. So um, have you looked into other options, right? Like, I mean, a simple extension of this is like, why don't we make it a weighted average? Or, or like, why, why, why is this the best option? So this is not the best option by any means, actually. Um, so it is probably possible to have, you know, a slightly better way to aggregate this. But then, you know, one problem is, you know, what's the principle I use to design this? So in the absence of such a principle, uh, you know, we just went with the simplest thing that, you know, occurred to us essentially. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's true that that could exist an alternate way to kind of weight these or you know incorporate performed aggregation such that we do better on these metrics but that is not something that we've done I, I see yeah exactly right that's that was exactly the second uh question that i had like can we actually minimize this by training psi on all the gradients right yeah that's a very good question yeah so this is not something that we've investigated yet but i think this could be something very interesting to look into cool. yep, thanks yeah Okay, so right. So just to summarize this part of the presentation, uh, we introduced a new tool called full gradient representation to visualize neural network responses at each layer, essentially. Um, and for convolutional networks, full grad captures naturally the importance of a pixel at multiple scales uh, due to the way convnets work, essentially. And our results show that full grad identifies important pixel, image pixels better than other methods. And if you'd like to, you know, play around with the code for full grad, uh, it's available online. Um, yeah, so feel free to uh, go ahead and use this. So maybe I can pause for like a minute or so just to see if there are any questions at this time. so far so good nobody's uh, has okay right? that's Anyone great have any question please please send it in the chat and i can stop the uh, speaker thank you yeah awesome okay so moving on um so here now i'll discuss this other method um this other paper called rethinking the role of gradient based attribution methods for uh, model interpretation which we presented at iclia 2021 as an oral presentation um, right. So here again, so this work is joint collaboration with my supervisor, um, Francois Florent. So in this work, we go back to the basics of interpretability, um, right, and try to ask the question of why are input gradients highly structured in the first place, right? So if you actually stand back and just look at the state of affairs, it should be very strange that this is happening. Uh, so essentially, what we are doing here is that we have um, uh, neural networks that are, you know, pre-trained to do classification, let's say, and then we look at their gradients. In this case, these are full grad like gradients, and then somehow they turn out to be highly structured despite not being trained to do so. Right. So we never had any regularization saying that you know the gradient should you know look here, look there, be structured in this way, and so on. But then somehow it happens that naturally the gradients are highly structured, and the common assumption in literature so far about this problem is that maybe it's because of the generalization capabilities of neural networks that naturally lead to such highly structured gradients, right? So maybe if the model didn't perform as well, so in, in like, let's say the first image, if it's not able to, let's say, recognize unicycles, then, you know, the model would like look everywhere. So uh, the fact that it is looking at the heat maps actually are strongest near the unicycle are because the model is able to recognize the unicycle well. And uh, yeah, this is a direct, um, um, reason for the generalization capabilities of neural networks, right? Um, okay. But then um, we do the small experiment where we see that is actually wrong, um, right? So the experiment is as follows. Uh, so we have 
let's say a standard ResNet model, and we visualize the logic gradients in the image in the middle, right? And then what we do now is that we just impose a simple regularizer. We kind of fine tune this model with a simple regularizer saying that the gradient should always point towards the top left. And we see that you know the regularization works, but still the model performs just as well, right? In particular, I could you know have a regularizer where the model uh, you know looks at wherever we want it to, um, right? Or we can arbitrarily shape the input or the logic gradients, but still uh, the model performs just as well, right? So this means that somehow logic gradients don't need to encode relevant uh, information about the image. Uh, like they do in this slide, but somehow they still do, right? And the question is why? Like the question essentially is when we have pre-trained models, why don't they come with logic gradients that look like the image on the right, rather than the ones that looking at the image uh, at the center, right? Okay. Um, so to understand this, uh, we have a very simple demonstration regarding uh, the shift invariance of softmax. Right, so let's look at this example where F i is the logic of a particular um, neural network with respect to class i, and um, F j uh, is similarly uh, the logic for the class j, and S i is like the post softmax output, and this is essentially the softmax function. And we know from the properties of softmax that softmax is shift invariant. That is, we add any scalar to all the logics, and the softmax output does not change. Right? And in particular, it could be not just a scalar, but a scalar valued function, which is what we add here. Right? So naturally, if this is true, then this means that you could actually replace the logics fi with f tilde i, where f tilde i is fi plus g of x, which means that uh, now your logic gradients are actually the logic gradients of f plus the gradients of x. Right? But remember that G was some arbitrary function that we chose. It's an arbitrary scalar valued function, which means that F tilde is also arbitrarily uh, structured in this case. Right? So what this means essentially is that pre-softmax logic gradients can be arbitrary, even if the model generalizes perfectly. Right? So because um, this G is arbitrary and yet SI is not changing in this case. So irrespective of the generalization of the model, pre softmax logic gradients can actually be arbitrary. And it turns out that similar but slightly weaker arguments also hold for post softmax gradients. So this is very strange, right? So this tells us that uh, pre softmax, looking at pre softmax gradients should never work in interpretability, but somehow it turns out that they always do, right? So as like the implications of this um, kind of observation, is that saliency methods, which actually rely on the logics, do not capture the discriminatory properties of the model at all, right? Because of uh, uh, the properties of um, softmax. And it turns out that commonly used implementations of saliency methods, including you know, the input gradient, smooth grad, grad cam, and you know, lots of others, even our original implementation of full grad, for instance, we used logic gradients. Uh, but then it turns out that um, logics actually don't capture the discriminative properties of the model at all, right? And this is often often done because pre-softmax gradients are often prettier uh, when compared to the post-softmax counterparts. They're cleaner and highlight, you know, which regions are important better. So this kind of justifies uh, their use case. Um, and they're also observed sometimes to perform better in some of these tests. So this kind of motivates their use case. Uh, but this is um, essentially uh, not supposed to work, right? So that's what this property is telling us. Okay, so this is the main question here. If that is, if not model generalization, what, it, what is it that causes gradient structure, right? Uh, so to understand this, we kind of take a detour at this point and look at this other paper, which is not related to the interpretability literature, uh, but this paper essentially connects standard discriminative models to generative models in the following manner. So let's say we have P of Y given X and we have the expression for the softmax, which gives P of Y given X. It turns out that if we write this using Bayes rule as an analogy, then we are able to write P of X given Y 
in terms of the exponent of the logits. And the idea here is that equation one and equation two, they're consistent with each other, right? So with the definition of p of x given y as an exponent of fi of x, um, then we get back this expression for p of y given x. This is all fine. Um, but the interesting thing here for us is that the gradient of the log of this quantity is actually exactly the same as the logic gradients, uh, which is the quantity of interest to us. So this is telling us that logic gradients, although they're not actually related to the discriminative model, they're actually related to the gradients of the generative model that is uh, implicit within uh, discriminative neural networks. Right, so this in itself means very little, except for uh, another interpretation of this quantity. Um, so in this paper, the hypothesis we put forth is that the structure of logic gradients is primarily due to the alignment of this quantity with the gradients of the ground truth log density. Uh, what this means is that we had this e e expression from the previous slide, which is that logic gradients are gradients of the log probability of uh, P of X given Y of uh, the model itself. And if it, if it turns out that this quantity is actually close to that of the data distribution itself, um, you know, then this is one way in which we could uh, provide some structure to the logic gradients, right? And this is uh, the concrete test that we do here. That is, if we actually, um, so the test here is as follows, right? So if we actually try to align these quantities, that is gradient, uh, the logic gradients and the gradient of the data distribution, and if you notice that the gradient interpretability properties improve, um, uh, okay, so essentially the, the test is that increasing the alignment of these two quantities should improve interpretability and decreasing this should deteriorate interpretability, right? So the idea is to find out whether the alignment between these quantities is indeed the factor that's responsible for um, interpretability in this case, right? Um, all right, so, yeah, so just to kind of summarize a little bit what we talked about in the previous two slides, it's just that we are able to um, view logic gradients as quantities um, similar at quantities related to the generative model implicit within discriminative neural networks. And the idea is that if this implicit quantity turns out uh, to be similar to the data distribution, in other words, if the model is implicitly performing generative modeling without us even intending to, um, then that explains the structure behind logic gradients, right? So the question is like, how do you, how do discriminative models actually end up accidentally becoming like generative models? So for that, we need to take another detour to look at um, energy-based generative models. So I won't go into a lot of detail about what these are, but essentially the idea is that um, these are models that are defined by just the numerator and the denominator is intractable to compute. Um, so sampling is often done by MCMC, in this case, Markov chain Monte Carlo. And in this case, uh, we can use a very simple MCMC approach called Langevin dynamics, which essentially just involves doing gradient descent, gradient ascent on the probability um, distribution. Okay. Um, I'll probably not talk about this too much in the interest of uh, time and clarity, but the idea is that there is a generative modeling approach called score matching, which is actually you know, very popular today in the generative modeling literature, which actually does the same thing what we want to uh, in our hypothesis, right? So uh, the objective in score matching is to align the gradients of the model and the gradients of the data distribution. And this is exactly what we want to test in our hypothesis. Uh, so score matching actually reformulates this in terms of like the Hessian and, and the gradient norm and so on. Um, but then there are some problems with, uh, right? So there are some problems with um, this naive version of score matching, which is that, you know, Hessian computation is like intractable and it's in, um, like furthermore, it's actually unbounded. So actually just to provide a bit of intuition regarding what's happening here, um, let's look at this, the first term in score matching, right? So this involves the trace of the Hessian in this case. 
And what score matching wants us to do is that it wants us to have this quantity go to negative infinity or be as negative as possible. So to understand what is, what is happening here, let's assume that our uh, data distribution is the Dirac delta distribution, right? So that is the curve in blue here, roughly. And then the curve in black or gray here is the density model that is trying to approximate this Dirac delta. So what score matching is telling us is that the gradient at x is should be as small as possible, which means that it's, it's like a local maximum, which is what we want. And then the trace of the Hessian should be, you know, as negative as possible, which basically means that this is squeezing the density model to be kind of as tall as possible. Of course, this is like an intuition. This only holds for like direct data distributions. Um, but yeah, so this holds for any for fitting any uh, generative model essentially. Again, feel free to like stop me and ask questions uh, at any time. Okay, so right. So again, so these things are not very important, but um, it turns out that the the formulation of score matching itself has some problems with it in terms of the like the computation and the stability and so on. So we propose a few tricks to um, make sure that these problems don't occur in practice. Uh, specifically, we use something called the Hutchinson's trick and like the Taylor series expansions to simplify the computation of the trace of the Hessian, which essentially just involves uh, difference of log probabilities. And uh, log probabilities in this case are actually just the logits, it turns out. Uh, so what you essentially need to do is just um, compute the logit value after adding some noise and then uh, divide it by the, um, actually or subtract it with uh, the logit value at the point itself. Uh, you can find the full derivation in the paper, but the idea is that the computation turns out to be remarkably simple uh, after these tricks. Um, and it also turns out that because the trace of the Hessian term is kind of unstable on its own, we add like a term here ensuring that uh, the square of the trace actually doesn't grow in magnitude. Uh, and this term is actually relatively small in practice. So this ensures that the whole training doesn't collapse essentially. Okay, so um, coming to like the meat of the experiments, uh, so this is what we end up doing. So we train four models with varying levels of um, alignment, uh, varying levels of um, alignment of the generative model. Right, so we have first the baseline unregularized model, which is like a standard ResNet for the CFR 100 task. Then we have the score match regularized model. In this case, the gradients of the, the logics of the model and the data distribution are aligned, more or less. And then we have another variant called the anti-score matching model, which is just like the opposite of the score matching objective, where we force the um, gradients of the model and the data distribution to be actually misaligned as much as possible. And then we just have another baseline, which is the gradient norm regularization, which is uh, just penalizes the gradient of the model. And the idea here is that we have these four models, which have different levels of generative modeling behavior. Um, and then now we look at the gradient interpretability properties across these four models. Um, so we consider this commonly used pixel perturbation test, which we also discussed in the previous uh, paper, which involves uh, masking unimportant pixels and looking at whether the model um, is able to still correctly classify the image after masking these, uh, after uh, masking unimportant pixels, right? And uh, in this case, lower the curve, the better. Wait, actually, I think, uh, okay. So in this case, we are using accuracy. So higher in this case is better. Yeah, sorry about that. So uh, yeah, so in this case, we see that score matching performs the best in this case, followed by gradient norm regularization, followed by the baseline ResNet, and then followed by the anti-score match model, right? So here, what seems to be happening is that um, the, the performance on this curve seems to be somewhat correlated with the alignment of the hidden generative model within discriminative models um, and, uh, and the data distribution, right? So, yes, yeah, so this kind of, uh, we have more experiments in the paper, 
But broadly, this confirms our hypothesis that um, implicit density model actually does influence uh, gradient interpretability in this manner. And even visually, we see that there's actually a lot of difference between the gradients of uh, score matched models and baseline models. So if you look at baseline models, the gradients are uh, kind of noisy for the CIFAR case. But then if you look at the anti-score matched model, gradients become even more noisy. Um, if you look at like the CNC maps in the middle and so on. Uh, but then once we apply score matching, we see that uh, the gradients qualitatively are different. And this is similar with the gradient non-regularized model as well. Um, so again, so taking a step back, so what seems to be happening here is that uh, there seems to be a parallel between the techniques used in some of the interpretability methods and some of the generative modeling methods, right? And these two are like, um, you know, different fields of uh, machine learning, um, usually. So in this paper, basically, we show that, you know, logic gradients, which are used for interpretability, are actually gradients of uh, the generative model, right? And it turns out that uh, visualization methods like activation maximization or like deep dreams actually can be viewed as uh, MCMC sampling of this distribution using Langevin dynamics. And something similar can be said about like the pixel perturbation test that we use to kind of uh, test the fidelity of these uh, saliency maps, um, right? So this is something that's interesting. Uh, and so just to summarize, we presented evidence in this work that logic gradient interpretability is actually strongly related to P of X given Y and not P of Y given X. Whereas in interpretability, we would like to interpret P of Y given X, which is what we have control over. But P of X given Y is something that we don't have control over necessarily. And that emerges kind of, you know, naturally due to the training dynamics and so on. But then most of these post hoc interpretive interpretability methods end up visualizing something to do with P of X given Y and P of Y given X, right? So the broad message of this paper is that the structure of these gradients depends on factors outside the discriminative properties of the model. In this case, we looked at uh, the generative property of the model. And in general, it's risky to apply off the shelf interpretability methods to black box models. So we'd like, uh, like to take a look at the code for this paper. It's, it's uh, online as well. Right. Just to talk a little bit about um, next steps. Um, so in, in both of these works that we had so far, we highlighted some limitations of saliency methods and talked about how some structure is necessary to make sure that um, um, these limitations don't exist. Right. Um, but then what we'd like precisely is a more precise identification of the limits of interpretability. Um, which requires actually a more common framework to think about all the various interpretability methods that exist in literature and not just gradient based interpretability methods. Right. And we'd also like to identify like some model families where this is possible and uh, where interpretability is possible and where it is not. So to this end, we have some preprints available. If you're interested, you can take a look. And the first one essentially talks about like a common framework. Uh, for unifying many existing postdoc explanation methods in literature, uh, which you can potentially use to choose an explanation, uh, right? So this also kind of um, talks about having a common framework, which also enables us to make like non-trivial statements about uh, interpretability in general. Um, and secondly, um, we're also looking at the class of low curvature neural networks as a promising model family where uh, interpretability is like possible and feasible. Uh, so the preprint for the second one should be out sometime this week and, and the first one is already available if you're interested in taking a look. Um, so this concludes my talk. Thank you for your attention and I can take any questions at this point. Thank you, Suraj. Uh, let's thank our speaker. Um, a fantastic talk. Uh, Questions? Yeah, I can start with one. Uh, so uh, I think actually like your last uh, uh, slide, the, the, the future work that you had uh, mm -hmm. is kind of like hinting at that, but it seems like when I look at the regularized loss function that you had in mm -hmm. the second part of the talk, 
it's actually preferring flat loss landscapes, right? It's, it's telling us that if your loss landscape is, oh yeah, exactly that, right? You have the Hessian there and you have also the gradient norm. So like this regularizer, it seems like it's going to prefer flat uh, uh, loss landscapes uh, compared to the non-flat ones, right? And uh, so is it true that then if you're training or network with, let's say, uh, optimizers that prefer uh, flat loss landscapes, then they should be more interpretable as well. That's one. And if that's the case, then it makes a lot of sense why SGD has kind of an uh, built in um, uh, preference toward more, more flat loss landscapes, right? And then mm -hmm. uh, the reason we have some interpretability, like if and when we are training our network, is because it's preferring more flat loss landscapes. So, right. So essentially there's a difference here. So when we want flat loss landscapes, we'd like the gradient with respect to the parameters to be small. But in this case, these are gradients with respect to the input. So this is preferring flatness in the input output um, function itself and not really the loss landscape, uh, right? right? But like, so uh, I, I understand that, but like when mm -hmm. you're saying that, uh, say if uh, you want to have a robust uh, method, right? Like I'm really thinking about the uh, input as also parameters of my network. I know that they are not the parameters of my network, right? But like mm -hmm. if you want to have a robust neural network, we want to have a neural network that it doesn't change much if we perturb the input, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm, I'm talking about flatness in that sense, right? Like mm -hmm. if there's robust. So essentially a robust network in this case is going to be uh, more interpretable. Is, mm -hmm. is that understanding correct? Yes. So that's what seems like is happening here but like honestly we don't have so far like a concrete connection between robustness and you know interpretability in in any you know quantifiable sense at least so that seems to be happening at least you know empirically uh yeah that is true but yeah so we don't have like a very clear understanding of what's exactly the phenomenon that's taking place here Right. Got it. So essentially the problem here is that we have robust models and somehow it turns out that they're performing better on these tests and they have better saliency maps, um, which kind of agrees with the hypothesis that we have, sure, but we still don't explain why this happens. Um, so it's true that this is exactly what is happening, but the question of why is this still out there actually? From, from what I can tell. Right. Thank you, yes. Uh, any other question from the audience? Hi. Uh, hi, Suraj. Hello. Thank you for your presentation. And so in the last uh, slide, you mentioned explanation. And mm -hmm. sometimes we heard uh, interpretability and sometimes we heard explainability. Mm -hmm. So do you think these two terms are the same or they have like difference? Um, I think, okay, so from what I know, there is no like agreement in literature about whether these terms are different or not. Like some survey papers would try to make a distinction between interpretability, explainability, some mm -hmm. don't. So in general, there's no consensus here. Um, I usually use it interchangeably. Like in case there's any like confusion in this talk, I tend to use it interchangeably. And another question is, um, how should we compare the performance? Of, uh, how can we compare the performance of different uh, ex interpretable interpretable methods? So you mentioned using the visualization and also use the quantitative measurements mm -hmm. of comparing the performance between and after the masking. But um, why, why these measurements, this quantification can actually capture uh, the quality of explanation? Like why we choose this type of measurements and is there any other ways of quantifying it? That's, that's a very good question actually. So, so the reason why those like pixel perturbation like tests were like formulated um, first, I mean, they're first formulated, let's say, in the computer vision community um, in a slightly kind of heuristic kind of fashion. Um, and it's true that, you know, how do you 
what's the correct way to actually um you know evaluate these methods and this is something we go into in this paper which is you know which explanation should i choose a function approximation perspective so the idea that we put forth in that paper is that every explanation can be actually looked at as a function approximation local function approximation method right so given like a neighborhood around a point it's trying to kind of fit a linear model in that neighborhood so essentially you can uh, one of the ways in which you could evaluate uh, models is to look at the performance of this uh, the approximation error of this uh, local function approximator um, but yeah so so that that is probably one of the takeaways here um, we also kind of show here that uh, you know slight differences in the way that you do the pixel perturbation test actually changes like the ordering of which methods come out on top and which methods come out on bottom um, so like to kind of summarize we don't have a ground truth for saliency methods or feature attribution methods which makes it difficult to evaluate them but we have several proxy proxies so one of them is like faithfulness which is characterized by your pixel perturbation like tests let's say there are other measures um you know based on like stability and so on which which people use in literature um but yeah it's true that evaluation is tricky and we hope that you know uh, having a common framework to talk about these things uh, you know might make things a little bit clearer yeah. Yeah. yeah so yeah so i mean yeah to, to answer that in like one sentence is like people have like four or five different metrics let's say like faithfulness different kinds of faithfulness and stability uh, which is what they try to um, measure but then it's not clear if these are the correct things to be using yeah yeah thank you uh, uh hi suraj uh, thanks for the presentation so i have a question in terms of like so since we uh, you have already proven that the uh the distribution before the logics of the interpretation is kind of similar to the generative distribution Mm -hmm. So um, could we leverage this observation like into designing some neural network model? So for example, like there are some works showing that some uh, existing augmentation schemes would generate some, some, some things out of the distribution and that would not be helpful either in the contrastive learning or some other things. So if we can leverage the, uh, could we like leverage this interpretation techniques to get those um, uh, distribution and further utilize those distribution to design some advanced techniques in, uh, to like increase the model generability itself? Um, that's a good question. Um, so actually I'm aware of this one recent work in ICLEAR 2022 where they use the values of the logics themselves, which is actually, you know, uh, let's say proportional to the P of X given Y. Right, so they use this particular quantity to do outer distribution detection. Um, right, so this is one work that I'm aware of. But with regards to like saliency itself, uh, yeah, I'm not aware of any works or like any approaches where you know one could actually increase the reliability of these models by doing anything with like their explanations. Um, but yeah, I'm open to like kind of you know hearing any options where that might be possible. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so we are right on time. Uh, let's thank our speaker again. Um, thank you, Suraj. This was a great talk. We really appreciate your time. And uh, yeah, thank you again. Okay, no problem. Yeah, it was nice giving a talk here. So yeah, see you. Fantastic. Have a good one.